the second panel of the day. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, this is the wonderfully titled panel, Metal, and I really enjoy all the, all the titles on this panel, so um, I was going to make a death metal joke, but I'm just going to move on. Um, okay, the first presenter today is Alex J. Taylor. Um, he's the Terra Foundation Fellow in American Art at Tate. Um, and he completed his DPhil in History of Art from Oxford. And also we have um, congratulations in order because he just got uh, a assistant professorship and a job as an academic curator at the University of Pittsburgh when we started this August. Um, he's the author of Carols in the Studio. <laughs> and um, his uh, talk today will be called Making Money. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is uh, to continue the puns that I'm going to i uh, sure we're going to continue all day. Newly minted research. Um, <laughs> bad, I realise. Um, it's fresh off the hotel printer. It's um, old archive work that I did years ago and stuck away in a folder and then hoped that I would have an opportunity to return to. So I'm pleased to revisit it, but I look forward to your feedback and suggestions and, and criticisms at the end of the paper. So... Great. In late 1962, pop artist Robert Indiana designed this new American penny. Quote, why not in plastic rather than in copper, he explained. Would not these multicolored chits express with zest and brick that basic unit of a monetary system? Even the national colors are incorporated, end quote. Indiana named it the New Glory Penny, as though Kennedy's New Frontier demanded a brighter, more convenient symbol than the flag, a national image properly built on money. His cheery, flimsy proposal practically demands to be frittered away, transforming the sober modesty of the one cent piece into something more like a fairground token or poker chip. Indiana was one of seven artists commissioned by Guggenheim Museum director Thomas Messer for the Coins by Sculptors project in 1962. He was the final artist to be invited to contribute a last minute acknowledgement of pop in a project otherwise dominated by artist, artists known for welded sculpture. Seymour Lipton, Theodore Rozak, Robert Engman, David Hare, Richard Stankovitz, and Richard Lippold. When Indiana's design was chosen over fellow contributors for the cover of Art in America, for which he produced a flatter, bolder rendering of his design in oil on canvas, it is tempting to understand his design as a token for the rising fortunes of pop and the diminished currency of those metal sculptors around which the initiative had originally been conceived. In this sense, the Coins by Sculptors project not only reimagined the symbolic requirements of American coinage then, but traded in the fluctuating values of the early 1960s art world. The idea for a plastic penny seems to have originated with Thomas Messer. As he wrote in a letter to Indiana, quote, while most other participants contributed their model in wax, the penny is thought of as something to be eventually executed in plastic. The suggestion recognised Indiana's difference from the other sculptors and perhaps linked the emerging pop idiom to the material of plastic itself and the, thro and the burgeoning throwaway culture that it had come to exemplify. But I think that it also tapped into a broader contemporary discussion about the future of American coinage. That was the result of nationwide shortages of small change that swept the United States in the early 1960s. A major reason for these coin shortages was the speculative hoarding of coins for the value of their metal. And this is an issue to which I will return. But at the time, the blame was more often pinned on a variety of other post-war consumer phenomena, including vending machines, jukeboxes, parking meters, highway tolls, and the extra change required for new sales taxes and 99 cent supermarket pricing techniques. Another alleged culprit was the booming hobby of coin collecting. 
the Lincoln penny since its introduction in 1958 was a particular target for hoarders, with certain varieties uh, rumoured to trade at some 200 times their face value. Minting errors fetched even higher premiums. In the case of the famous double die penny from 1955, commanding hundreds of dollars even for pennies that had been in circulation. In 1964, the Mint even announced that the date on the following year's coins would remain unchanged, hoping to thwart collector appetites with an unending stream of undifferentiated coins. To try to prevent the disappearance of coins, the Federal Reserve began rationing supplies to banks, who in turn limited their supplies to customers, actions that only buoyed the hoarding activities of business and consumers alike. <laughs> to deal with these shortages of small change, it was reported that some stores had begun issuing wooden nickels and other forms of scrip redeemable within their business as a substitute for legal tender. In 1961, amid the small change panic, American newspapers noted with interest that Britain's Royal Mint was considering plastic for low denomination coins. According to a US Treasury report a few years later, several plastics manufacturers picked up on the idea and pitched their materials for use in coins. Now, Mesa and Indiana may not have known any of this, I realise, but I think that this coin's use of plastic taps into a broader cultural awareness that new ideas, maybe even new materials, were needed to solve the widespread shortage of coins that was impacting every American consumer at the checkout. Before he had turned to Indiana, Messer had first invited Alexander Calder to design the penny in mid-1962. Messer's letter refers to the involvement of a foundry, so we can assume that at this point it was planned to be metal. But no less than Messer's idea for a plastic penny for Indiana makes suggestive correlations between style, materiality and denomination, the original allocation of the one cent piece to Calder capitalised on this artist's own modest construction of snipped metal and wire. And this is some <coughs> quick and dirty portraits to kind of roughly make the point that I'm thinking of here. The same connections might be observed in the allocation of the highest <coughs> denomination $25 gold piece to Richard Lippold, whose gilded wire suspensions had inflated Calder's wire constructions to their most extravagant and futuristic fantasy. I will return to Lippold's coin later, but my point is simply that more than capitalising on the associations between particular metals and particular sculptors, Messer's project can be seen to have cast artistic identity in monetary terms. For his part, Calder seemed somewhat put off by the low denomination he was allocated. Quote, it seems a bit fantastic to talk about a penny when I was under the impression that your museum wished to put on a show of my work, he replied. <laughs> Calder indicated that he would like to design the penny, but that he would only participate if the coin was actually to be minted. Messer had left such possibilities ambiguous in his letters to artists, but once the project was completed, he was clear that the designs, quote, must not be mistaken for minting proposals. By the time he sends his final letter on the project to the participating artists, it seems as though the possibility of minting the coins was little more than a pipe dream. Quote, we of course do hope that some official interest will be shown and that those concerned with minting coins would at, le at least take cognizance of a potential creative contribution, he wrote in mid-1963. Theodore Rozak was also dissatisfied with being offered the dime and, presuming he was limited to the size of the current coin, asked for an alternative denomination. Quote, should any of the large size coins find themselves sans sculpture for whatever reason, I would find it more compatible to design for a larger format, he wrote. <laughs> Rozak's design was the only coin that featured a date 
uh, in the future. As much, I think, a pragmatic prediction as the time frame for minting as it corresponds to the futuristic imagery he chose. As Rozak explained, the balloon form on one side of his coin represented the head of an explorer filled with instruments for, quote, scientific observation and the recording of interstellar data. The reverse represented, quote, the great American city. Turning his back on the, his angst-ridden style of the 50s, Rozak returned to, to the machine age optimism of his pre-war constructivist style. Although David Hare's design settled on the ostensibly more conventional symbols of sky and the land, it shared Rozak's allusion to the space race, as Messer put it, eschewing, quote, a purely national identification for a design that instead suggests a planet-wide solidarity. Seymour Lipton described the abstract figure on his nickel as a hero image of the founding fathers. <coughs> like Rozak's effort, Lipton's design converted existing sculptures into relief. On the rear, Lipton's design um, was based on the flowering form of his 1953 sculpture, Sanctuary, reproduced as, the artist explained, quote, a reference to American material and spiritual growth. Coins, as these designs indicate, were understood by many of these artists as a powerful vehicle for national self-imaging, and, th and through this project, one that artists could help shape. Quote, what more could the artist image maker desire, desire and this is uh, Messer, what more could the artist image maker desire than to engrave his set of values, his ideals, his sense of the national personality, upon millions of little objects that change hands innumerable times, Messer declared. His final phrase, hoping not only for the ultimate fine art multiple, but that these coins were ones that would not be hoarded. The Guggenheim Museum's archives on this project reveals the names of several artists who evidently refused Messer's invitation to, to design a coin. Alongside Calder's unrealized contribution, Julius Schmidt had also declined to design the penny before it was offered to Indiana. Jacques Lipschitz and Jose de Rivera both seem to have passed up the chance to design the nickel. Isamu Noguchi and I think probably Louise Nevelson refused to design the half dollar. The archives do not reveal the, re re the reason for most of these refusals, although the ironic absence of any artist fee might have had something to do with it. But in at least one case, the refusal was also political. When David Smith wrote to Messer to refuse his invitation to design the stainless steel dollar, his scathing letter assumed that the project had, nas had official backing. And he wrote, quote, I can share no enthusiasm for the administration who has no enthusiasm for art. The administration through Mr. Heckscher tours the country claiming affinity for the arts, but as I told Mr. Heckscher on the recent Hofstra podium, art is painting and sculpture, not jazz bands and racial musicals. And the Kennedy administration has done no more for art than Eisenhower. For you, for Mesa, for you I'd like to, but for their cause it is a waste of time which I cannot afford. In case his anti-Kennedy sentiments were mistaken for conservatism, Smith ends with a final rider, which does not mean I voted for Nixon, he stipulates. <laughs> Smith's rejection reminds us of the resonance of the values of this project with the cultural policies of the Kennedy administration. Another of the participating artists also acknowledged the administration's high profile prioritization of arts and culture. In the statement on his coin, Robert Engman notes that, quote, on the occasion of a fundraising campaign to construct a government supported cultural center in the nation's <laughs> capital, and this becomes the Kennedy Center, of course, President Kennedy stressed the fact that all great cultures of the past have been determined or measured by their arts. For Engman, 
uh, repeating this quote, the idea of artist design coins could um, serve to bolster America's cultural prestige. Kennedy had appointed August Heckscher to the newly created role of Special Consultant on the Arts in March 1962 to lead the government's policy efforts in this arena. In May, a couple of months before Messer pitched the coin project, Smith had participated in a panel discussion with Heckscher and Broadway composer Harold Rome entitled Artists and Audiences at Hofstra College in Long Island. Unlike Engman, Smith was evidently unpersuaded by the middle brow focus of Kennedy's efforts. Although it might first bring to mind the State Department's earlier international tours of Porgy and Bess, Smith's barb about racial musicals probably refers to the presentation of scenes from West Side Story at the White House in April 1962, where plans for concerts by Louis Armstrong and Benny Goodman uh, were, had also been announced. And when Coins by Sculptors was reproduced in Art in America, editor Jean Lipman explained that the project sought to, quote, suggest practical ways of bringing America's painters and sculptors to the widest popular audience, suggesting the project indeed sought to cut across those cultural hierarchies that Smith sought to uphold. It wasn't, I think, unreasonable for Smith to assume that Heckscher and therefore Kennedy were behind the initiative. In a June 1962 interview, one month before Messer began inviting artists to participate, Heckscher noted that, quote, because the government is both a printer and a coiner on a very large scale, it should examine the possibilities which reside in these functions to ensure that the quality of the products befits the government of a culturally ambitious people. This was then a matter of national reputation and coins, ironically, were to be charged with defending allegations of America's shallow materialism. The United States, this is Heckscher again, the United States will be judged and its place in history assessed, not just by its military and economic power, but by the quality of its civilization. Heckscher's final report on the arts and, on arts and the national government doesn't mention coins, but it does target postage stamps for their lack of artistic input. The possibilities of the latter field had been demonstrated by the Stamp Designs by Fine Artists initiative in 1961, shown at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and also reproduced in Art in America. As the Met's print curator, A. Hyatt Mayer, explained of this project, our stamps could perfectly well keep pace with the evolution of our art and act as its bulletin in little, the way Greek coins kept pace with the epoch-making experiments of Greek art. The time seems ripe for a general change in the official look of our government, for the US Treasury has suggested that banknotes of different denominations might be distinguished by difference of colour. Didn't get around to that. <laughs> as a as uh, someone about to come to the United States who has paid a taxi driver with the wrong note. I wish you would. <laughs> I wish you would. Um, our coins of a generation ago were often well designed by our best sculptors, but now they need fresh ideas as badly as our stamps. Perhaps they could be designed by the distinguished sculptors who have recently been designing medals. Mayer's reference to earlier coins designed by America's best sculptors alludes, of course, to another possible catalyst for Messer's initiative. In 1961, a one-off high-relief experimental coin design by Augusta St. Gordon's had been, that had been commissioned by Theodore Roosevelt was donated to the Smithsonian by the president's nephew. Press coverage of the gift widely praised Roosevelt's, quote, campaign for a more artistic series of United States coinage designs. In the context of Kennedy's own declaredly progressive cultural policies, the renewed attention on this earlier effort may well have contributed to the idea that contemporary sculptor sculptors could be engaged to do the same. 
After the designs were exhibited at the Guggenheim in 1963, the museum lent the small exhibited exhibit to the Philadelphia National Bank, where whose close proximity to the Philadelphia Mint provided added relevance to the initiative. Just as the Mint was considering new materials, several of the other artists in Messer's project proposed uh, materials not traditionally associated with coinage. Apart from Indiana's plastic penny, there was also Stankovitz's aluminium dollar, alumin, aluminum dollar, <laughs> again with the, the perils of transnational scholarship, right? Um, I'm going to have to get good at aluminum. <coughs> in the shape of an ingot or perhaps a credit card, and also Robert Engman's stainless steel quarter with its punched out denomination literally absent from the coin. The specification of such materials alludes to the possibility, I think, that the coins of the future might, need, might have needed to be made from such base metals. At the other end of the spectrum, it is relevant that when Messer described Richard Lippold's gold coin, he justified its high denomination by noting that, quote, a $25 coin no longer seems beyond reason if we consider that its true value may not be far above the old silver dollar." End quote. We can assume, I think, that Lippold's coin was to be merely plated in gold, but it is Messer's cognizance of the true value of a coin that interests me. It was important that Lippold's coin was gold rather than silver. For it was the rising demand for this material that represented the most significant threat for the future of American coins, and indeed made the idea of new designs something of a real possibility. The skyrocketing industrial demand for silver for use in economic, in electronics, in batteries, in photographic supplies, and other industries was in the late 50s and early 60s being met not by increased silver production, but by the sale of silver from the rapidly depleting stockpiles of the US Treasury. Worse still, the rising market price of silver meant that the silver content of coins would soon be worth more than their face value. So in 1963, the price of silver reaches $1.29 an ounce, such that the metal in a silver dollar was worth its face value. Once the price of silver rose to $1.38 an ounce, the Treasury faced the disastrous prospect that half dollars, quarters and dimes would be more, worth more melted down for their silver content. All of this meant that the United States had little choice but to change the manufacture of its coins. In 1965, quarters and dimes containing silver were replaced by composite coins in nickel-clad copper a solution in part chosen so that it would work with coin-operated machines without modification. President Johnson explained in announcing the change that, quote, today's coinage must be primarily utilitarian, aware, perhaps, that some would regret the missed artistic opportunity of the decision. Without wanting to stretch its significance, I think there is something about Messer's reference to the true value of a silver dollar that also points to the broader connections between art and money in the early 1960s. Here, for instance, is Whitney Museum director Lloyd Goodrich complaining of the, quote, peculiar economics of the art world around this time. Quote, assuming that there is such a thing as an intrinsic merit of a work of art, we may ask to what extent that merit affects its commercial position, he asked. Quote, does the price of a work of art permit us to draw conclusions in regard to its artistic merits? End quote. As museums courted donations from collectors seeking tax deductions, often on the basis of inflated valuations, these were questions that were of more than theoretical interest to museum directors like Goodrich and Messer. The zeitgeist is, for our purposes, nicely captured in this 1961 cartoon by Roy Doty, in which the purchases of a smug art collector are shown as nothing less abstract than variations on the dollar symbol. 
And ultimately, I suspect that it was this idea that art might come to stand for money, and worse, that money might come to stand for America, that caused so many sculptors to decline the opportunity to participate in this project. Perhaps Messer also understood this, and I quote, what can we as consumers ask for but that such coins tell the truth about ourselves, that they represent us in terms of what we really are today, he wrote. That, I think, was precisely what David Smith was so worried about. But even for those who did participate, it is hard to imagine that the act of making money did not prompt some reflection on the almost alchemical manipulation of value involved in turning scrap steel into precious artworks, much like the fiat decree of an unbacked currency. Aspiring to place millions of relief sculptures into the pockets of all Americans, Messer's project would have undoubtedly participated in the democratizing spirit of Kennedy's cultural policies. And even if these projects remain unrealized, their designs materialize the confluence of culture and affluence that, in the early 1960s, became so central to America's self-image. Thank you. Finally, we have Jennifer Marshall, um, who is an associate professor from the University of Minnesota and is the author of Machine Art 1934. She's currently writing a monograph on self-taught sculptor William um, Edmondson, mm -hmm. um, and she has a PhD in art history from UCLA. Um, and her talk today is entitled Bunny Money. It is. It was initially titled this when I didn't know what I was going to write about. <laughs> so, it's not up yet. Though. Oh, it's not up yet. Thanks. Um, Visual jokes, not. <laughs> <laughs> It was until the Heyman Center for the Humanities. Yes, right. <laughs> Insert talking. None of that. There we go. Right. But I started referring it to it with my friends as bunny money, so I thought we would just run with that today. Uh, my, one of my graduate students saw this on the website and said, are you writing about strippers? Which is not true. <laughs> Which is not where I'm taking it at all. Um, yes, and it's an apocryphal story in my family that when my grandparents lived in Ireland in the early 60s, my grandmother could never learn the denominations of the Irish coins, so she would just hold out a hand of coins and people would collect what they needed, more or less, we hope. So let's begin with the bunny. A sweet and erect little hair, modeled and cast in low relief on the surface of a disc four and a half inches in diameter, a 1927 design for new coinage to be issued by the Irish Free State. Just look at the hind legs on that little guy. <laughs> scrunched up under the rabbit's body around its rolled and pelted paunch. That hind leg describes a rare moment of rabbit repose. <laughs> Rabbits, of course, can dart and flee at just the whiff of worry. And really looking closely, worry still seems to stiffen this poor guy's spine. The lines of the tendon, tendons described on the front leg form an alert arrow with the prick and perk of the ears. These are radars, rotating to receive danger's first call. The body is still, but it's an exclamation point. The back legs scrunch and tuck, but they are springs designed for launching. But launching in this case where? There's no room for our bunny to bound. There's the decisive limit of the disc's raised and wide rimmed edge, Equally damning is the lettering, designating the Irish threepence. It's a crowded typographic design, not helped in the least by the awkward incorporation of the rabbit, trapped off-center, his nose wrinkled in. That nose, it's wrinkling. To historians of American sculpture, there is something familiar in the excessive folding effect of this delineation. It betrays a habit toward outlining sensed also in the rabbit's haunch and paunch, as well as around its eye. This was a descriptive affectation of Paul Manship, a consistent element of his signature orientalizing style. He is almost the only living artist who enamels his figures, wrote the British archaeologist and sculpture critic Stanley Casson in 1930. Those wrinkling details on our rabbit, thus disclose, at least to connoisseurs, the telltale trace of an artist's individual and individuating hand. Manship was an accomplished, accomplished medalist throughout his career. 
He designed honorific medals for the Audubon <coughs> Society in the US Navy. He designed Franklin Roosevelt's inauguration medal in 33 and JFK's in 61. Although most of course know Manship for his large scale works at Rockefeller Center and the Bronx Zoo, he enjoyed the challenge and charm of a handheld low relief. He was even known to make quick metal sketches of his friends when they came over for tea, modeling their profiles on clay discs as they sit, which is, I think, a nice flattering thing <laughs> to do for a guest. Uh, but no, this proposed Irish three pence was not his best design. He submitted it by invitation to the Irish Free State Coin Competition in 1927, a contest that invited accomplished sculptors from around the world to realize a suite of pre-selected emblems. The committee, chaired by poet William Butler Gates, sent photographs of typical Irish wolfhounds, hares, and horses to the participating artists as a guide for their work. Manship's submissions were easily received and admired. But given the problems enumerated above, the rabbit's visual entrapment, his suggestion of worry, the enam his enameled eye, and the hints in it of Manship's individual hand, it's no wonder that the committee rejected the design. Let's just focus here. You can learn a lot about how material signs work by paying attention to money. Specifically, you can learn to think about material signs, not just in terms of their symbolic register, what art historians call its iconography. You can learn also to think about what these signs in three dimensions do, how they work. The case of Manship's failed Irish threepence is instructive in this way of thinking, because it shows us how closely the iconographic and the operational registers are aligned in material signs, or how close they need to be. After all, the design's failure stems specifically from its failure to coordinate iconography with purpose, to align the symbolic with the operational. For the coin design to work, its picture and purpose ought to have been better coordinated, combined like two sides of the same coin. And if we all got a nickel for every pun we used uh, today. Uh, kidding aside though, the registers of the symbolic and the operational really are bound in the same way as coin faces that is, by a substrate of materiality. In his recent books, how, uh, book, How Things Shape the Mind, the archaeologist Lambros Malafori has sought to theorize the uniqueness of the specifically material sign, a category that, of course, encompasses both of our interests here today, art and money. Malafori's insistence that objects' physical properties contribute, uh, ma he insists that objects' physical properties contribute to their role in symbolic interactions. They have a say in what they mean. We may be able to make, shape, transform objects, even destroy them, but these are acts that are always achieved only in consultation with the physical properties of things. When we manipulate objects in any way, including to serve a social semiotic function, some control over this manipulation remains squarely on the side of things. Another way of saying this is that materials don't arbitrarily stand in for meaning, they also embody it they guarantee it by way of its, their very presence. Uh, to help with this concept, Malafori turns to Gregory Bateson, so let's do it too. Um, the bronze lions in Trafalgar Square could have been eagles or bulldogs and still have carried the same messages about empire, and yet how different might their message have been had they been made of wood? Okay, so Bateson's upshot is debatable. Certainly eagles and bulldogs and lions have distinct material natures which delimit the kinds of human concepts they're made to carry, just like rabbits. Uh, but he's got a point about the symbolic non-commutability of wood and bronze. How does bronze speak differently from wood? And here it seems that we're encountering another category of sign beyond Charles Sanders Peirce's icon index symbol trifecta. The, the semiotic meaning contributed by materials, bronze, say, or bunnies, might be said to be incarnational. It signifies not by resemblance, Peirce's icon, uh, not by resemblance, the icon, nor by contiguity, Peirce's index, nor by convention, Peirce's symbol. Instead, the meanings that materials bring to the semiotic table are brought in, are brought in by the very form of their being a semiotic ontology that I've elsewhere termed a participatory ontology of meaning. 
I want to get back to this idea of a participatory ontology of meaning because it helps us see how materiality does more than just determine its semiotic function, but how it guarantees this function too. And as that word guarantee might suggest, this discussion is also going to offer me the best route back to money as an especially exemplary model of the material sign of semiotic ontology. It is also going to allow me to turn the screw further on this discussion. But I'm missing our bunny, uh, and I want to tell more of his story. Perhaps what's most disappointing in Manship's design is that coordination between its sim intended symbolic and operational registers was certainly possible. There are plenty of things to recommend rabbits to monetary symbolism. Their quickness, their agility, their responsiveness to threat, their self-protective burrowing. Yes, they even burrow into banks. Uh, and of course, their penchant for multiplying. But Manship's rabbit is stock still, trapped and afraid, hemmed in by typography, caged by circumference. Even the insinuation of Manship's signature style is a problem. In effect, were Manship's designs to have been issued as coins, they would have had two signatories, not just the Irish Free State and its fiduciary calculus, but also Manship and the structuring valuation provided by authorship and oeuvre. Banked on these two forms of guarantee, the coin would have obeyed two regimes of value and so have diluted its claims to both. Individuation also plagued other submissions to the competition. Submitted by the Croatian artist Ivan Mistrovic, this design is too jagged and too stylized. Like Manship's submission, this is too clearly the work of one man. The design is also notably too modernistic, a visual idiom by no means associated with semiotic stability. In point of fact, Mestrovich uh, submitted his model too late for consideration. He sent it along anyway just to show his goodwill in the matter of Irish self-determination. Nonetheless, his designs were not likely to have been serious contenders if for no other reason than the impracticality of their high relief. And certainly the same might be said for these by the Swede sculptor Carl Milas. So you can see them there, really kind of funky, chunky animals. But now take a look at this bunny. The work of the British sculptor Percy Metcalf, who swept the coin competition by a unanimous vote. Here is a bunny who knows how to do its monetary job. <laughs> the ears still listen, but they somehow worry less. There is an alertness to danger and risk, but also the opportunity to, res to respond nimbly to it, the typography parting to make way. The denomination denotation is dealt with confidently, the three banked under a ground line underfoot. The anatomy of the, pl the plausibly mobile bunny also signals strength, suggested by the strong rectangular massing of his body and the pyramid drawn in and upward by legs and feet. Readiness combines with sturdiness, soundness with agility, picture ma matched to purpose, check. Sim symbolism supporting function, check. And what about the physical coin itself? Metcalf's already near anonymous treatment of the bunny was simplified even further when issued, smoothed into generality, merged with metal, and tamed to suit the purposes of the gambler's flip and the banker's roll, uh, two constituents constituencies that Yeats wrote explicitly about needing to please with the Irish coins. <laughs> no additional slurs. Okay. <laughs> the three pence coins with the rabbits on them were minted in nickel, as was the six pence piece featuring a wolfhound. The nickel composition made these coins especially enduring in use. They were more durable and more resistant to corrosion than the other coins issued in 1928, all struck mostly in silver. The silver coins were more materially valuable, uh, and they bore pictures of what Creative Art magazine called nobler animals. But they couldn't withstand the more daily use of the three and six pence pieces, suited to coin slots and counter slaps. Indeed, for each coin in the new Irish system, the physical composition instantiated function. Their materials are coexistence with, coexistent with, but not the sum total of their value. And this is how coins work. They are finely tuned material signs for which operational, symbolic, and material registers are all brought together in perfect, if obsessively regulated, equilibrium. 
much can be same, the same can be said for art. Money, I think, is particularly good at helping us notice the importance of synecdoche in material regimes of semiosis, if for no other reason than that it offers us the figure of the coin, an object that represents the whole by embodying just a part of it. Indeed, the coin is the ideal figure of a participatory ontology of value, an ontology that I hold maintains more generally in the field of material signs. This because the coin embodies and apportions value in its very stuff. The coin makes value real, singular, and autonomous, real worth itself, there in the palm of our hand. But the coin's value is also as referential as it is real, deriving its meaning from absence as much as from presence. It stands in self-consciously as only one token, drawn from a larger whole. It derives its value from elsewhere, from a remote cache and unseen hoard. In its material form, money has, making, uh, has a making present function, true. But there is a flip side to this conceit. To incarnate value or participate directly in its very essence is always a double position, a two-sided semiotic ontology of presence that is also always banked on absence. An ideal of value held in reserve, Jean-Joseph Gou writes, that is also always imaginary. The coin is in front of us, we can pocket it. But when we do, we know the value it promises draws upon certainties forever out of reach. When the new Irish state undertook to introduce a wholly new coin set in the late 1920s, during an era of acute fiduciary transformation around the globe, they surveyed the public for ideas first. The new Irish citizen re-suggested round towers, the treaty stone of Limerick, St. Patrick, and shamrocks, single or in reeds. But the committee ultimately rejected these suggestions, taking advice instead from antiquarians who told them to avoid patriotic emblems altogether. As Yeats wrote, after all, even the shamrock was, uh, emblem was not a hundred years old. The sticking point with these patriotic symbols then was how young they were, and implicitly how conventional, how arbitrary, how immaterial. Yeats elaborated on the problem. Nationally specific symbols have a tendency, he wrote, to quote, grow empty and academic, unquote, as their cultural reference dull over time. There was another suggestion uh, from the public for Christian saints, uh, but this was dismissed on the grounds that that money might get converted into objects of devotion instead of circulation. Instead, Yeats wrote, if we decided upon birds and beasts, the artist might, might achieve a masterpiece. In order to be successful, the new coins would need to draw not just upon the guaranteeing function of the new Irish free state. Yes, this assurance was emblazoned on the front of all the coins, a 500-year-old Irish harp in Sierstadt, Iran, but this symbolic guarantee required the backup of something surer, the self-guaranteeing presence of an artistic masterpiece, emblazoned as support on the back. That the committee felt so, strong, felt so confident that animals were the best way to ensure artistic quality is telling for our story too, because it reveals again the importance of the material register of money's signifying logic. Manship, Mistrovich, Milis, Metcalf, all of these artists were tasked with interpreting subjects that would represent value immediately, eminently, inherent in their very bodies, at least as these bodies are pressed into service by man. Here we're seeing the full suite by Manship. <coughs> After all, the woodcock, pig, hen, hare, wolfhound, bull, salmon, and horse weren't just any animals found on Irish soil. This was a monetary menagerie that had indisputable value to Irish agriculture and the family table. These were animals valued in and of themselves, and often for their very flesh. Time magazine made light of the quaintness of this numismatic economy, where American children rehearse coin conversions through cumbersome rope, through cumbersome rote, five pennies are a nickel, two nickels are a dime. Irish children, quote, must count in the following strange fashion, two sows are a hen, three hens a hare, and so on. Not just the metals of nickel and silver then, these coins drew also upon the material horse sense of a barter economy. And still that nod toward practical presence signaled an absence, 
the endless convertibility of husbandry and consumption. And something else too. The new coins in 1928 drew also upon the absence of the failed but publicized designs themselves. Manship's artistic authority and evident effort might not have worked for the minted coins, and ditto that for Mastrovich and Milis, but the, uh, but the vaulting of his unrealized design in the velvet-lined, climate-controlled case of an American museum is itself a withdrawn but active source of value. Manship's failed bunny money is like its own rabbit. Uh, trapped, still stuff, a numinous source of value, supererogatory to exchange. In reflecting upon his committee's charge, Yates acknowledged that the only people who ever spend any time looking at money are artists and children. And now, today, we can add to this short list art historians. <laughs> <laughs> and so, a final thought. To function as money, money needs pictures, but it also needs to transcend them, to move so fast those pictures disappear. Money's design is thus a kind of camouflage, not too individuated, not too modern, not too idiosyncratic, not too high in relief, certainly not too Christian, nor too faddish, camouflaged in movement, just like a rabbit. In circulation, money denies its materiality while relying on it too. In this way, Money puts its own presence, its pictorial, material presence, into reserve. Something available and right there in front of us, but with the flip of a coin or the flash of a tail, not there at all. Pardon.